did Jesus think he was truly divine? Dr. William Lane Craig has argued that the answer is yes, based on Jesus' claims to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and the Son of Man. I invited an expert on the origin of divine Christology to comment on Dr. Craig's case. That expert is Dr. Andrew Loke. Though Dr. Loke is a Christian and believes that Jesus is truly divine, he still had some criticisms of Dr. Craig's arguments, and along the way, he offers some suggestions on how we can make this case stronger. Now, what exactly are you gonna get out of this video? Well, here's the structure. In section one, Dr. Loke lays out six major kinds of views that have been offered by scholars to explain how the belief that Jesus was divine arose. In section two, Dr. Loke summarizes the main argument of his book, Studies on the Origin of Divine and Resurrection Christology. The argument that he summarizes there is absent from Dr. Craig's video, so you'll definitely wanna watch that section. In section three, Dr. Loke comments on a clip from Dr. Craig's video where Craig says that Jesus' claim to be the Messiah was a claim to be divine. In section four, Dr. Loke comments on a clip from Dr. Craig's video where Craig argues that Jesus' claim to be the Son of God was a claim to be divine. In section five, Dr. Loke comments on a clip from Dr. Craig's video where Craig argues that Jesus' claim to be the Son of Man was a claim to be divine. And in section six, Dr. Loke concludes our discussion. Now, pay close attention to what I'm about to say next. Throughout each section of the video, there will be a little light bulb that appears in the top right corner of the screen and some text on the screen as well. When you see that, that's my way of signaling to you that Dr. Loke is making a key point and you should pay close attention. Those are gonna be your main takeaways from this interview. All right, with all that out of the way, let's get started. Dr. Loke, in your book, Studies on the Origin of Divine and Resurrection Christology. I'll hold it up there. I have an UNO card as a bookmark. You mentioned these six categories of theories about the development of divine Christology. So the first is the early evolutionary theories. The second is later evolutionary theories. So the both types of evolutions, one's early, one's late. Third, the early unfolding theory. Fourth, the later unfolding theory. So that's kind of easy to remember. They're both unfolding theories. One's early, one's later. Now, five and six are a little bit different. So five is the explosion theory, you call it. And then six is some kind of combination of one through five. So can you maybe just explain what each one of those kind of theories say very broadly? And then I think that will help situate where Craig is when it comes to these differing views on divine Christology. The evolutionary theory suggests that the earliest Christians worship Jesus as a God or, or make him into a God. Even though he himself may not have claimed to be a God, but the earliest Christians make him into a God and worship him as a God as a result of pagan influence. And so some suggest that it took place rather early, say around the mid first century, and others suggest that it could have taken place later, say towards the end of the first century, when the Gospel of John is written, you know, by that time, we can definitely see the highest Christology in the Gospel of John. So that is the early and the late evolutionary theory. Whereas the unfolding theory suggests that the divine Christology was the results of trends within Second Temple Jewish monotheism. Uh, in Second Temple Jewish monotheism, we find that you know, there, there, there is a talk about the Messiah, talk about the word, wisdom, traditions. And as the result of this influence, the, the early Christians began to apply this onto Jesus and you know, regard Jesus as a kind of divine figure. So, so that is basically the, un, the unfolding theory. Okay? So it's not, a, it's not the result of pagan influence, but a result of trends within Judaism itself. Now, as for the explosion theory, what it suggests is that divine Christology was the view of the very earliest Christian community, which began in Palestine. And it's explosion because it is not as the result of some kind of development, whether it's due to pagan influence or Jewish influence, but it, it just exploded right at the beginning. And many scholars have argued that the best explanation for this explosion, which we do see, I'll, I'll mention later that there's evidence for this, is that Jesus himself claimed to be divine and shook himself to be divine. That is the view, that's the argument of anti-rights, for example. That is also my argument, which I've defended in a number of books. And Dr. Crick would also belong to this camp as well, right? 
uh, in the video, as I think you will show it later, uh, he, he did mention that you know, uh, Christians have regarded Jesus as divine from the very beginning. Okay? So it's, it's a, a kind of explosion. But nevertheless, it's, it's a pity that he didn't make use of this consideration to argue for the historicity of the saints in the Gospels uh, of, of Jesus um, claiming to be divine. Right? He didn't use this consideration to argue for the historicity of those. But I think he, he would fall, fall into uh, this uh, explosion theory can. Right. And the reason why I hold to this explosion theory rather than the pagan theory or the evolution theory or the unfolding theory is that I think it makes the, the best sense of the evidence of Christ, the early Christology, which we see in the letters of Paul, right? So where we read the letters of Paul, we can find out what is it that the earliest Christians believe. And Paul's acquaintance with the earlier the early Christian communities was very wide. You know, he, he traveled around, he met with the apostles, he met with different communities, right? So he, he knew what those guys were, were doing, what were teaching. And in 1 Corinthians 15, for example, he claims that you know, we preach the same gospel, that Jesus died, he and he, he resurrected. He was buried, he resurrected. He said that not only I, but they, you know, we all preach the same gospel. Of course, the central, the fundamental aspect of the gospel is Christ, right? Paul wouldn't have said that we preach the same gospel if you know, the 12 apostles were preaching a low Christology, while Paul himself was preaching a high Christology, right? And, and we know that Paul was preaching a high Christology because we read in various passages in the letters of Paul, say, for example, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, uh, it says that all things came through Christ, right? And in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, he says that all things came through God, right? From God, through God and through God, right? And the same Greek word, dia, was used. And, you know, there are many other evidence. This is one evidence which indicate that Paul holds to a highest Christology, which regard Jesus as truly divine, as divine as the Father. So this is one evidence that the earliest Christians were in widespread agreement right, that uh, Jesus was truly divine. And by truly divine, I mean as divine as the Father. And moreover, it is unreasonable to think that they hold to this view as the result of pagan influence or just merely unfolding of Jewish tendencies. And the reason is because the, when we read the letters of uh, the writings of the earliest Christians, where we find that they hold to a very traditional, strict Jewish monotheism, where they regarded only the creator God deserved to be worshipped by human beings. We see this creator-creature division, this divide very clearly. Say, for example, in the letters of Paul, in Romans chapter 1, you know, it says that, uh, that people know that, can know that there is a creator, but even though they know that there's a creator, they, they fail to worship the creator, but it says it's that they worship created things. And that is the sin of idolatry, right? So both in the letters of Paul and also in the Old Testament, which the earliest Christians affirm, right? They, they regard the Old Testament as their scripture, unlike Martian, who came in the second century. So the earliest Christians, you know, they, they hold to this, this strict Jewish monotheism and they, re they absolutely reject you know, pagan idolatry. So given that this is the case, they wouldn't have make up Jesus, make Jesus into a God to worship and commit the, the, the sin of idolatry and also being willing to be persecuted for it because we know that the earliest Christians were willing to be persecuted. Even though it, it may not be the case that all the apostles died as martyrs, but we know that at least some of them did. And we know that the others continued to preach the gospel despite knowing that at least some of them died for their faith. And the letters of Paul also indicate that there, there were persecution going around. So this indicates that you know, this earliest highest Christology is not, was not the result of pagan influence and neither was it just the result of some development of Jewish trends, right? Because it, even though you know, there, there, there were you know, this idea of uh, the wisdom of Messiah, but nevertheless, we, we, we do not see any indication of real worship of any his, historical, of, of any persons in Second Temple Judaism and as, as divine, right? So, for example, the earliest Christians, even though they respect Abraham, but they did not worship Abraham, even though they respect David, they did not worship David, you know, even though they regard Peter or Paul as great apostles, but they did not worship Paul or Peter, right? So, given that this is the case, why would they worship Jesus? My argument is that so if Jesus that never claimed to be divine and showed himself to be divine, the earliest Christians wouldn't have come to this widespread agreement that he was, right? But, but they did. And so given all these considerations, I argue that there was a historical Jesus who claimed and showed himself to be divine. That, in a nutshell, is the summary of my argument. Yeah, yeah. So just, I'm going to try and give like a 60 second summary to make sure that I'm tracking with you. You think that one of the best pieces of evidence that Jesus regarded himself as divine 
is that his earliest followers regarded him as divine. And if asked why, what's the evidence that his earliest followers regarded him as divine, you would point to something, you could point to several texts, but as an example, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I'm giving to you what I received, this gospel message. I got this from his followers, and here's what we teach about Jesus. So Paul was in agreement with Jesus' disciples, his followers. And Paul, from his letters, teaches that Jesus is divine. So then his earliest followers teach that he's divine. Is that the gist of... Yes, that's right. Now, even though Paul didn't say clearly in First Corinthians 15 that he regarded Jesus as divine, right? He mentioned the death, burial, and resurrection, but not the divinity of Christ there. But definitely Christ is central to the gospel, and, and obviously. And in other passages uh, in the letters of Paul, say for example, in the very same letter in First Corinthians, right, in chapter 8, verse 6, I mentioned that verse just now, that that verse clearly indicates that Christ is of the same divine nature as the Father, right? All things came through him, right, as I mentioned, in, in light of Paul's theology that all things came through God, right, which we read in Romans, for example. And so we, we need to put all these pieces together. It is not controversial that we can find out what the earliest Christians believe by reading the letters. We can find out what they believe, even though what they believe may not be true. Even if they think that they receive it from divine revelation or, or whatever, that is what they believe. It's just like if you want to find out what the earliest Muslims believe, right, we can read the Quran or Hadith, right, regardless of whether it is true or not true or whether it is historically accurate or not accurate, that is what they believe. There's nothing controversial about, about that point. My, my argument is that, yes, we can find out what, what Paul believes by reading his letters. And yeah. then we can give other historical considerations to argue that belief is also widely shared among the earliest Christians. I mean, Paul wouldn't have made up the, the claim that, oh, other apostles also share my belief. Why? Because the Corinthians, they knew some of these other apostles, right? So this is another point which I argue right. in my book. Right, that in First Corinthians chapter one, Paul was saying that you know, some people were claiming to be followed Kephas, Peter, and obviously you know, these other these Corinthians they knew this guy, they knew him. So given that this is the case, but Paul wouldn't have make up the story to claim that you know, a false story, claim that okay they also claimed the same as I. If they, in fact they didn't. It's just that uh, you know, I wouldn't make up a story to claim that oh you know Justin Mooney was a Muslim. Right? I, I wouldn't claim that to, in my email to you right? because I I know that you know him right. You, you would throw my email away, right? You wouldn't regard my email as Holy Scripture. Yeah. So, so there are these and many other considerations I, I use in my book to argue that we, we know for a fact that the earliest Christians did believe that Jesus was truly divine. And then we, we provide an argument to show how is it possible that they come to this, how, how is it the case that they come to this such a belief, right? And in my book, I exclude all the other possible theories we, we mentioned at the beginning. The only reasonable explanation is that it must have came from Jesus himself. Yes. Okay. That's really helpful. So that explains the main argument of this book. And I'll mention one thing, and then I want to go back to the Craig video. You did a debate on my channel with Dr. Dale Tuggy. And the reason I mentioned that here is somebody like Dale Tuggy would disagree with you that Paul is teaching, or you said, you know, what does Paul believe? Paul believes that Jesus is divine. Del Tuggy's going to disagree with you on that point, And he's going to say the same thing about the other writings of the New Testament. Now we can't really flesh out who's right. All I can say is if somebody's watching and they're interested in seeing how Dr. Loke would respond to that sort of objection that these earliest followers didn't actually believe that Jesus was divine, go check out that debate. After the debate, Nadeo you know, Tage made a number of videos right, to try to respond to my arguments. And I have written a document which point out the flaws of his follow-up videos. So if the readers, are, if your audience are interested, they can look, you know, go to my academia.edu website. I have a document that document my response to his follow-up videos. I can make sure that's linked in this video as well. Okay, so now to connect this back to Craig. The, I wanted to mention the book, partly because in this series, I, I made it a goal of mine. The people that I interview to comment on Craig's videos are experts on the topic that, that the video is about. So you are an expert. You've published a book with Cambridge University Press on the topic of the origin of divine Christology. And then this one. Yeah, and, and this one is published in a monograph series edited by two leading New Testament scholars, David Capes and Michael Burke. 
Right. That book with Cambridge was the one that laid out my arguments. And this follow-up book is to respond to some objections that people have raised since the publication of that book. The point in all of what we said so far is that there's this consideration, this piece of evidence that you think points very strongly in favor of Jesus regarding himself as divine. But this piece of evidence is absent from the video that Dr. Craig made. And so you think it's worthy of offering that consideration to the viewers because they might watch Dr. Craig's video and walk away unaware of what you think is a really strong piece of evidence that was unmentioned. Yes, and the reason why I want to emphasize this point is also because I have engaged with the top scholars, the top skeptical scholars on the other side. People like Bob Ehrman, for example, right, who has uh, also written a book, yeah. How Jesus Became God, and you know, he has debated with Michael Burke as well on the, all these topics. In, in my book that I engaged, I responded to Ehrman, so I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what kind of objections Ehrman and other skeptical scholars would raise against the, that sort of argument that Craig raises. We will talk about some of these objections later on as, as you show the video. Yeah, but at this point in time, I just sort of back this issue out. One interesting thing about Ehrman is that you know, if you read the book, how Jesus became God. You'll find that he deals very quickly with 1 Corinthians 8, 6, you know, the key passage which I mentioned just now. You know, it's like, you know, he just mentioned this very briefly and didn't actually respond to the argument which I gave just now for thinking, for, for showing why is it the case that 1 Corinthians 8, 6, in light of Paul's background, uh, Paul's theology, that, did, that does indicate the highest Christology for Jesus. Right. So this is an important piece of evidence that Herman just quickly go past. And also uh, other pieces of evidence, such as the evidence of strict Jewish monotheism, which I also defended and also briefly mentioned just now. In my book, I respond to Ehrman's objections concerning that point as well. Yeah. So for details of all these arguments, I'll encourage your audience to take a look at the book. But I just want to point out that you know, this is a very important consideration, which uh, can provide a very good response to the skeptical scholars on the other side. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at Dr. Craig's video here. Ever since the Christian movement began, followers of Jesus Christ have said he was God in human form. But what about Jesus himself? Who did he think he was? When historians investigate the Jesus of history, what do they find? First, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. Jews of Jesus' day were waiting for a promised Messiah a descendant of King David, a warrior king who would bring military victory and spiritual renewal to Israel. They were familiar with the prophet Zechariah's ancient words, Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, the final week of his life, is attested in independent sources, one of the most important criteria for the historicity of an event. In doing this, Jesus was deliberately and provocatively claiming that he was the promised Messiah, the King of Israel. Moreover, the plaque nailed to Jesus' cross stated the charge against him, in mockery of his messianic claims. The fact that later Christians did not use this derisive title for Jesus underscores its authenticity. For first century Jews, the word Messiah was packed full of meaning. By assuming this title, Jesus was claiming all of this for himself. Okay, unfortunately, you know, I feel like that last part was really crucial, but it's so short in the video. A bunch of time was spent defending that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. That point doesn't seem to be too contested among New Testament scholars, but what probably is more contested is that a claim to be the Messiah is a claim to be divine. So is a claim to be the Messiah really a claim to be divine? Yeah, that, that is a very good question that you're asking, Jordan. And indeed, among skeptical scholars, even Ehrman, for example, right, they would be quite happy to admit that Jesus may have thought of himself as a kind of messianic figure, but that doesn't imply that, that doesn't imply the highest Christology. It doesn't imply that, therefore, Jesus is as divine as, regarded himself as divine as the Father. It doesn't follow from that. In fact, even the Muslims, will, even some Muslims, even many Muslims will be happy to admit that Jesus was a kind of messianic figure to the Jews, right? The Muslims believe that he was a great prophet, servant of God, and can be regarded as a kind of 
be sending figure, but that doesn't mean that he is the divine son of God. Historically, the important point we need to note is that in the first century, many scholars have argued that there wasn't a unified view of the Messiah in the first century. Therefore, if we want to argue for the divine self-understanding of Jesus, we will need to take into account other points in, into consideration. The, the reason why many historians think that there wasn't a unified view of what Messiah means is that one piece of evidence is we can look at Justin's dialogue with Trico, which is written in the early to mid second century, but it reflects the earlier the Christian and Jewish debates about Christ, for example. Now, in Justin's dialogue, chapter 49, we find that Trifo, who represents, in the dialogue, he represents the Jews, right? He argues that to us, Jews, it is more plausible that the Messiah is of merely human origin, right? Rather than pre-existent as, as divine, right? Which is what the earliest Christians thought, as I argued, right? You know, Trifo argued that that is not very plausible to us, he, he claims. Because for us, we, we think that the Messiah is of merely human origins. And, and so this is one piece of evidence which indicates that uh, it is not the case that you know, the, the, the Jews of the 1st or 2nd century, they, they share a unified view of Messiah. Some may have thought of the Messiah as a spiritual Messiah or, or even a divine Messiah, but other Jews may not hold the same view. So there, there were um, a variety of different views. And as Richard Bockham points out, we should remember that the Hebrew Bible contains a range of texts that might be understood to refer to the Messiah. And what sort of Messiah one is envisage depends a lot on which text one chooses to emphasize. Now, of course, as for, for us Christians, on hindsight, after we come to recognize that Jesus is the divine Son of God, then the, the, the truly divine, right? and then we look back, we look at those texts in the Old Testament, right? then we will say that, okay, this refers to Jesus, that points to Jesus. And for us, uh, many Christians would, would, would think of the Messiah as divine, right? Say, for example, the text in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, which says that uh, for unto us a child is born, and uh, this child will be called Mighty God, so everlasting power, Mighty God. So this word Mighty God, we read from other parts of Isaiah, we find that you know, it refers to Yahweh. Many Christians will say, well, doesn't that mean that the Messiah is truly divine? We need to note that this text, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, is not widely emphasized among by, by the Jews. Not, not all Jews share, share this view. We don't find Jesus applying Isaiah 9, 6 on, on himself, right? We, we don't find that. Now, we, what we do find is that Jesus did apply Daniel chapter 7, the, the Daniel son of man upon himself, according to the gospel, right? We will talk about the Daniel text later on. And I think that is the, the, actually the key text, actually. My point here is just to say that, you know, just claiming to be Messiah by itself doesn't prove anything, right? We need to look at other texts, right? We need to look at other things, other considerations in, in order to show that Jesus regard himself as truly divine. The other thing I also want to mention is the historicity issue, which we talked about at the beginning, right? You, you'll find at, just now in the clip that you played, at the very beginning, you know, he says, the very first sentence is that ever since the Christian movement began, followers of Jesus have said that he was God in human form, right? That was the very first sentence in the video clip. But there are two things I want to say. The, the first thing is that the video, now I understand that it's a short video, so it doesn't cover everything. But I think an important thing which should have been mentioned, which is good to mention, is that the earliest Christians hold to a strict ancient Jewish monotheism, the point that you know, I mentioned earlier on. So given their strict ancient Jewish monotheism, how would they regard Jesus as God in human form? It, it would be something very difficult for them to do. So unless right, Jesus himself claimed to be divine and showed himself to be divine. So that's an important point. And so, yeah, and my second point is that, you know, this consideration you know, was neglected in the rest of the video, right? The use of this point. Rather, when, what, from what we heard just now in the video clip, we find that the clip talked about multiple attestation as one important historical consideration. And these are, this is one of the various tools that you know, historians have developed, as the clip says. However, the clip doesn't say that, well, we know, we know that it's, it's, it's just a short clip, but, but that this is uh, also something important which we should uh, clarify is that these tools, by, you know, they, they have, there are some limitations to the use of the, the criteria for authenticity. Right? Multiple independent attestation, for example, by itself just means that it is likely that the independent sources got 
their information from an earlier source, right? And that's why you know, there's independent attestation. But by itself, it doesn't mean, it doesn't imply that the earlier source is therefore accurate or it came from Jesus, right? No, this also, I mean, we need to consider the possibility that they could be attesting to an information that comes from an earlier Christian who made up the claim, who made up the story by putting Jesus, words into Jesus' mouth, by claiming that, oh, you know, Jesus said that he's the Messiah, when in fact, Jesus didn't say this. I mean, that, that is a possibility that we need to consider and to exclude, right? And so, multiple independent attestation by itself doesn't actually prove anything too. But nevertheless, when multiple attestation is used together with other considerations, such as those which I mentioned at the beginning of this video, the earliest, highest Christology and the ancient Jewish monotheistic context, and the fact that, you know, the earliest Christians wouldn't have falsified the intention of their teacher, etc., right? All these considerations. When we take all these other considerations into account, then multiple attestation is powerful. Combined with all this, it provides uh, overwhelmingly compelling evidence to indicate that uh, all, all this must have come from Jesus himself. That he must have said something like this, such that we find this in multiple independent sources. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, so let me go to the second clip now. Jesus' consciousness of being God's son in a unique sense comes to expression in his parable of the vineyard. This parable matches Jesus' teaching style and employs Jewish motifs typical of his day, such as Israel as a vineyard, God as a father, the religious leaders of that time as tenants, and God's prophets as servants sent to the tenants. Once there was a man who planted a vineyard. Before leaving the country, he leased it to tenants. At harvest time, he sent a servant to collect his share of the fruit of the vineyard, but the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. The owner sent more servants, but these too were beaten or killed. Finally, he sent his one and only son, saying, Surely they'll respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Let's kill him, and the vineyard will be ours. So they killed the owner's son. What do we learn from this parable about Jesus' self-understanding? He thought of himself as the only son of God's final messenger, distinct from all the prophets and even the heir of Israel itself. Okay, so it seems like it's not contested among New Testament scholars that Jesus claimed to be the son of God. But what probably is more contested is that the claim to be the Son of God is a claim to be divine. What do you think about that? Yes, indeed. Well, this is the key point of contention, right? Now, before that, so again, let's talk about the historicity issue, right? You find that so in the video, it gives a number of ticks, right? The, the video argues that so this account is historical by saying that uh, it fits Jesus' way of telling parables. Uh, if, if it's the Jewish way of, of the telling uh, parable style, and the, the parable style and also the Jewish motif. But then again, I, I think uh, these arguments for historicity, again, I think that they are quite weak because I think this can be imitated, right? I mean, we can imagine some early Christians imitating Jesus' style of fighting story and then in, make up this story. Some early Christians can also copy the, uh, the Jewish motif as well. These arguments for historicity, I, I think you know, they, they are, uh, again, quite weak. But, you know, so as I said at the beginning, I, I think we need to use uh, other considerations. So if you want to argue that this implies some kind of divine Christology, then you will, we will need stronger arguments. And the arguments would be those that I mentioned at the beginning of this video to, to argue from the ancient, strict ancient Jewish monotheistic background. And also how could it be that the earliest Christians right, come to a widespread agreement that Jesus was truly divine. Those will be powerful historical considerations that we can use as a backdrop to argue for the historicity of um, passages such as this. If we want to think that you know, this passage does indicate a highest Christology and to argue for its historicity, then th that will be a much more powerful argument. However, uh, th there is also uh, the, the question of whether the Son of God by itself implies the highest Christology. As you rightly pointed out, uh, there are many skeptical scholars including Bart Ehrman and also Paula Fredrickson. She's a well-known New Testament scholar, uh, a skeptical New Testament scholar. And she and some other scholars have argued that for the early Christians and also met many ancient Jews, you know, she, she argues that you know, they, they may have hold to a view of henotheism. So henotheism means that you know, there's one God at the top. 
and many other god or godlike fi figures below these one higher scores. And they like to argue from passages such as Psalm 82, right? Yeah. Yeah, some of you may know this passage. Like Varnkiancle right? type things. Yeah, this are in the midst of the gods, right? Like, uh, according to the passage, Yahweh says, that I, I have said that you are God, right? You are Elohim, right? Yeah, so they, they argue that, okay, the ancient Jews, they have this view where there are many gods. And, and so if we just look at this passage, about the parable of vineyards, he says that, okay, Jesus is the unique son. He may be a God-like, this may imply that he's a kind of a divine-like figure, but that doesn't mean that he is as divine as the father, right? Or he, he could just be God's, the, the highest God's lead, the canon, that you use the word Ferguson use, right? So he may be one level below, okay? And so we have to be careful when we talk, when we say that Jesus is divine, what do we mean by divine? What kind of divinity are we talking about? So this sure. is another important issue, which I explain in my book. So in my book, what I argue is that using words like God, God or Son of God, all these by themselves are not very helpful. Right. Rather, what is more important is, as I said earlier on, the creator-creature divide. I mean, it is true that the ancient Jews may have thought that you know, there are many gods in that sense, but nevertheless, there is only one God who is the creator of all things. And so in that sense, it is still a monotheism. It's not just mere henotheism, but rather there is a sharp divide between the creator and the creatures. Those other so-called gods, they are all create, created things. So they are not involved in the act of creating all things. Whereas in the Old Testament, we do find that you know, there is only one God who created all things by himself. And as I said, in the letters of Paul, the earliest Christians also hold that view. And they regard Jesus to be within that one God who created all things came through him. In Romans, Paul says all things came through God. So that implies that so Paul regards Jesus to be within the one being of God. So that would be a very important response to Fredrickson. My, my point is that so this parable of the vineyard by itself, again, it doesn't prove what Dr. Craig wants it what wants to prove. Dr. Crick's point in this video is that Jesus is claiming to be the unique son of God, the, the one that's set apart from other prophets and other, being, uh, other persons. But even then, it, it could just be a kind of a lesser deity according to um, mm -hmm. the interpretation of Oliver Fredrickson and others. It, it doesn't prove the highest Christology. So now let's move to the third one. Jesus claimed to be the son of man. This was Jesus' favorite self-designation, being used some 80 times in the Gospels. This has convinced the vast majority of New Testament historians that Jesus did, in fact, think of himself as the Son of Man. Notice, not just a Son of Man, but the Son of Man. Jesus was directing our attention to a vision described by the prophet Daniel. I saw in the night vision. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. At Jesus' trial, the Jewish high priest accused Jesus, Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? His answer left no room for doubt. I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. By applying all three of these titles to himself, Jesus was claiming, in no uncertain terms, that he was the very God his accusers worship. Now, the first thing you will note is that the phrase Son of Man by itself can also have a variety of different meanings, just as the, the term Son of God, it can also mean different things in different contexts. So just now we mentioned that the Son of God can refer to kings, can, Son of God can also refer to angels, and angelic beings, um, also called sons of God, right? Now, Son of Man can also refer to just a man. But in the, the passage in Daniel chapter 7, that vision in Daniel 7, it describes a son of, the, the particular Son of Man who is said to come on the clouds and he received the same kind of worship as the Ancient of Days. Okay, so in that passage, the Ancient of Days refers to the God who created everything, the creator of all things, Ancient of Days. 
that's the phrase that's used to refer to the creator God. And it's saying that that son of man, Danilic son of man, received the same kind of honor and he says to come on the clouds. And in, again, in the Old Testament, there are 70 overtimes where God is said to come with, with the clouds. Uh, this description is used exclusively for the creator God. So we find that you know, all these this descriptions that is used of the creator God is being applied to that son of man. And so these are ways to indicate that you know, that son of man is as divine as the ancient of days. And in the Gospels, Jesus, according to the Gospels, portray Jesus as applying that particular son of man, the Daniel son of man, on to himself. And that was why the high priest shouted blasphemy. Right. And we also need to note that this claim of blasphemy in the Gospel of Mark, for example, is also used in Mark chapter 2. So after Jesus claimed to have forgiven the sins, and the, the claim that no, the, the, the parrot sins were forgiven, but then the, the Jews were saying among themselves, oh, who, who is, well, this guy is saying blasphemy, who can forgive sins but God alone? So that was their belief. And so what the Gospel of Mark is trying to portray is that Jesus was saying the kind of things that only the Creator God is supposed to be, you know, has, has the right to say. And so when we take the Mark chapter 2 passage together with the Mark chapter 14 passage, right, the, the trial before the high priest, when we put all this together, you know, we find that it is very consistent, right? That all this indicates that Jesus is claiming the very highest Christology. And so I think these are important points right, to prove that Jesus was indeed claiming the highest Christology according to the Gospel. We take all these considerations. But just now, when we, when we look at the video, we find that a number of these considerations were, were not mentioned. Right? So the, the clip mentioned about the Messiah, Son of God, and things. Uh, but it doesn't mention coming with the clouds, which I think is important. It doesn't mention that uh, the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7 will receive the same kind of worship as. And also, this overall picture that Mark was trying to portray, taking into account not just Mark chapter 14, but also Mark chapter 2 as well. And this is important. Why? Because we find that there are skeptical scholars who have tried to object to this, right? And also scholars like Dale Tagi, who I debated. You know. now, he, has, he has his own interpretation of the Mark chapter 14 passage. And so he and some other skeptical scholars, they have argued. So for example, some skeptical scholars have argued that the, the blasphemy right, can be applied in other ways. So for example, a person insults the leaders that are appointed by God, that can be also be regarded as a blasphemy state, right? So blasphemy by itself doesn't mean that Jesus therefore claimed the highest Christology, which they disagree with. However, if you take those other considerations into account, when we look at, because when we look at the Gospel of Mark, we need to understand the authorial intention. What was Mark trying to say when he say that, you know, the high priest say that you know, they, Jesus has committed blasphemy? We had to look at the, at the other past passages, such as Mark chapter 2, for example. So in that passage, as I say, who can forgive sins but God alone? Right? That is the Basel escape claim. Right? So it's not just a matter of insulting the Jewish leaders or what, right? but Jesus was accused of that's maybe because he was claiming things that only the Creator God has the authority to claim. Right? And so when we take that into account, the context of Mark, together with the background in Daniel 7, then it becomes very clear that Jesus was claiming the, the very highest, highest Christology according to the Gospel. And so this is the way to refute the skeptical interpretations, the interpretation of skeptics. And so we, we need to bring all these points together rather than just those points that are, that are mentioned in the video, which by themselves, it's not so adequate. I also have something to say about towards the end of the clip. So can you play any? Oh, points? the very end, sure, yeah. It's no surprise the Jewish court charged him with blasphemy and condemned him to death. But that's not all. New Testament historians are agreed that the historical Jesus also claimed to have divine power and authority to perform miracles, cast out demons, revise Old Testament law, and forgive sins. Jesus' self-understanding cannot be reduced to that of a Jewish teacher or a charismatic leader. No. In fact, by putting himself in God's place, Jesus was making a far greater claim about himself than anyone else ever has, before or since. Just now, you see that uh, Dr. Craig, you mentioned about uh, forgiving sins, miracles, and all this. Now, I think that uh, the, the list of things, is, uh, they, they are of different weights. And we need to also look at them in context as well. 
for example, performing miracles by itself, again, it doesn't prove anything, right? Because we know that there are also other people in the Old and New Testament who done miracles. But when we took it, take it together with other things, then it, it is part of the cumulative case. So I think that they are of value as part of the cumulative case. And for giving sins, as I said just now, in Mark chapter 2, is highly significant. Even though in Mark chapter 2, Jesus didn't give a clear response, right, to right, when the Jews asked this question. But when we take that, Mark chapter 2, together with Mark chapter 14, we find it's very clear that you know, Jesus did regard himself, right, as, as a divine person. And so these are of different weights, and we need to, but if we take them together as part of community case, and also in context, then it is a, a powerful case that the, the gospel writers are trying to portray that Jesus claimed to be truly divine. Now, later on, uh, now of course, the, the skeptics might, might argue that uh, the gospel writers may be making things up, right? But as, 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 I, as I argued earlier on, in light of the ancient Jewish, con sorry, ancient Jewish monotheistic context of earliest Christians you know, and how the earliest Christians were in widespread agreement that Jesus was truly divine, you know, in light of all those considerations, we have good reason to believe that you know, the gospel writers are indeed writing down something that you know, Jesus must have said something like that in order to account for the uh, widespread earliest, highest Christology. Now, towards the end of the video, you find that um, it ends by saying that no one from the past or ever since have claimed something like that. Now, I think that, that claim is a bit overstated because when we look at the history of religions, we find that there are some people, let's say for example, some, some cult leaders who have claimed to be the creator God. So for example, in among the Chinese Christians, we are, you know, I am a Chinese, right? So I'm well aware of the, the state of uh, Chinese Christianity currently. And we are, uh, many of us are aware that uh, there, there was, there's a cult called Eastern Lightning Cult. I don't know whether you have heard of it because they, they have also moved to the States as well. I um, didn't, I've never heard of yeah, it. So you can check out the Eastern Lightning Cult, right? They also call themselves the Church of the Almighty God. They claim that Jesus Christ has returned again in the form of a woman, a female Christ. And this lady, she claimed to be the creator God. So she claimed the highest Christology for herself. Mm. So we, we know that there are people like that. <laughs> and it's not surprising that you know, there's this cult people. So Jesus was not the only one who has claimed highest Christology for himself, right? So Dr. Quick's claim is false, actually. It's overstated, right? There are people who have made such claims as well. But of course, those other people, there, there is no good historical evidence to show that they overcome death, they resurrected from the dead. Okay? But Jesus, we have good historical evidence to show that he resurrected. And resurrection is not something that a mere human being, a liar or a deluded person or a lunatic or a person who is sincerely mistaken could, would be able to do, to raise, to overcome death. Yeah, as, as you will be familiar, and many audience will be familiar as well about the, the C.S. Lewis tri uh, trilemma argument. Uh, if Jesus was not divine, truly divine, then who, who, who is he, right? Either, he, I, I, I formulated the argument this way, right? So either he knew what he say is not true, but he still say it, right? Which means that he's a liar. Or he didn't know what he said was not true, right? Maybe he was sincerely mistaken, right? Something wrong with mine. But of course, right, all this cannot explain the resurrection, right? A person who is a liar or, or sincerely mistaken or wouldn't be able to overcome that. And so the only reasonable explanation is that he was indeed truly divine. Right? He was telling the truth when he claimed to be truly divine. And so when we take these arguments together, we find that you know, there is a very good case to be made to show that Jesus was truly divine. And that also answers the question that many people have. Many people have this question. After they listen to the Kalam cosmological argument and the fine-tuning argument, they will ask, so why think that the God who created the, the universe is the God of Christianity? And my answer is that, well, because of Jesus' claims and his resurrection. So given these two pieces of evidence we put together, we, we find that it's, it's invisible to think that Jesus was a liar or lunatic or whatever. And the only explanation, good a reasonable explanation is that he is telling the truth and being able to rise from the dead as a piece of evidence to support these claims. And therefore, we can know that the God, that he, he is, was indeed the, the revelation of the God who created the universe. And so this answers the question, why I think that the God who created the universe is the God of Christianity? And, and this is an important answer to many atheists, many skeptics. Uh, even people like Richard Dawkins, uh, he, he's willing to admit that, okay, yeah, I can think that it's reasonable to be a deist given the fine-tuning argument, he has said something like that more, more recently. But he finds it very difficult to believe that this deistic God is the God of any religion. And my response is that we need to take into account his claims and his resurrection. So when we take that, those into account, that will show that he is not a deistic God. 
existed, but rather the God who created the, the universe is a God who had revealed himself in history in the person of Jesus Christ to provide salvation for all of us. Excellent. Well, I'll point people once again to your book, Studies on the Origin of Divine and Resurrection Christology. You unpack everything you said in this interview, you, you'll unpack in there. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you so much, Jordan. I want to thank Cascade Books for providing me a free copy of Dr. Loke's book. I really appreciated it. If you would like to pick up a copy of the book, there's a link in the description below. Finally, if you want even more evidence that Jesus claimed to be divine, then check out my interview with Dr. Craig Evans. You can click right here to watch it now.